Our last speaker in this session is Bill Mullen from UBC and from Microbiology and Immunology, who's going to tell us about what do microbiomes have to do with forestry. So a little change in direction here, and uh, from human uh, biology to forest biology. Please join me in welcoming with Bill. Okay, um, in the, this short talk, I want to try and do uh, basically three things. Uh, first, simply to um, show you, in case you're not already aware, that microbiomes uh, exist outside of humans. Um, second of all, I want to give you some examples of how we've uh, been investigating uh, a soil microbiome and um, trying to get beyond, basically, just seeing who's there and trying to figure out what they might be doing. Um, and finally, I want to uh, give you some evidence that microbiomes may be um, indicators that are useful for understanding highly complex systems. So, um, um, almost all animals probably and have microbiomes, uh, and the same is true of plants. And we can also look at larger systems, such as the oceans or forests, <coughs> and see that they have microbiomes associated with them as well. And um, the particular one I'm talking about today is the soil microbiome associated with forests. Uh, soils tend to have very dense communities, typically uh, on the order of a billion microbial cells in one gram of soil. And these communities also tend to be some of the most diverse that we're aware of, uh, often having on the order of a million species within that gram of soil. The soil system does lots of important things in forests. I would argue most of the really interesting and, and important things in a forest system happen underground. Um, as just one example, nutrient cycling is uh, very much catalyzed through microbial activities. Um, now, I want to just take a pause here. I should preface this. I'm talking about work that was part of a much broader uh, Genome Canada, Genome BC funded project. Um, it wasn't all just about um, forest soil ecology, but I'm just focusing on a small part of it here, a small part of the overall project. And uh, for this work, we were partnered with the Long-Term Soil Productivity Study, who have um, field sites across North America. And uh, we took uh, over 700 soil samples um, from 18 sites um, in six different ecozones spanning North America. So you can see quite a distance uh, represented, quite a large area represented. The main point of this study is asking, or trying to answer the question, of how much organic matter you can sustainably take out of forests. And so they have the same very simple experimental design at all of these sites, where um, they have plots which are, were harvested 10 to 15 years ago, and um, there are reference plots that were not harvested, and then additional treatments with differing amounts of organic matter being removed. So I'll be referring to these OM1, 2, and 3 treatments throughout the talk, and those represent increasing amounts of organic matter removal. Um, so 10 to 15 years after uh, this was initiated, um, basically there's little evidence at this point that the trees are being differentially affected by these uh, these different areas. <coughs> but we hypothesized that the soil microbiome might reveal effects of harvesting before they're manifest as reduced tree productivity. And so that's one thing we we're really interested in looking at. And uh, the first thing, obviously, to do is to characterize who is present in the microbial communities. And so we also used pyrotag analysis, uh, just as Deborah described. Um, we looked both at bacteria and fungi. And so for the bacteria, as an example, or just sort of an overview, we have um, on the order of, uh, well, several uh, million quality reads, uh, having about uh, almost 9,000 reads average per uh, sample to represent the community composition. And out of this data set, you can see that we have over 200,000 operational taxonomic units, which more or less uh, correspond to microbial species. So this is an example of what I meant by saying that these are highly diverse communities. And uh, the, the main observation here in terms of community composition is that it was overwhelmingly driven by ecozone or by biogeography. 
And so here you can see an ordination that clusters the various samples according to the similarity of the microbial communities. And you can see a very strong clustering of the different ecozones that are coded in different colors. And we see a similar but not quite a strong pattern uh, among the fungal uh, communities. So um, what we did not see was a strong effect, or at least a strong consistent effect, of these harvesting treatments on community composition. So these bar graphs show the amount of variability in the overall data set associated with a few of the variables. So you can see that the pale blue indicates the vast majority of variability of bacterial communities and fungal communities is associated with ecozone. And only this very small red bar is indicating the amount of variability that was associated with the harvesting treatments. So we don't see a big effect on community composition overall. So we need some other approaches to try and, and get at the, the questions. Um, one of these is to start looking at, in, at populations within these communities that have important functions. And so we used an approach called stable isotope probing to look at uh, various populations that use specific substrates. And so in this example, we looked at hemicellulose degrading microorganisms, which are important in the decomposition of, of woody biomass. And so to conduct these experiments, we actually incubate the soil in the lab with C13 labeled hemicellulose. And then after that, we extract the DNA and we separate it by density gradient centrifugation. And we then isolate the heavy DNA that's enriched with C13. And then we sequence that DNA to identify the organisms within that very large, diverse community, which were actually incorporating the hemicellulose. And then, having identified 105 bacterial OTUs and 54 fungal OTUs out of those, those hundreds of thousands of OTUs originally, we went back to look at their fate in the different harvesting treatments within that in situ data set of pyrotags. And so there we find a much stronger effect of, treat, of the harvesting treatments. And so again, it's not a, a this ordination again is now showing us um, the data are coded for the different harvesting treatments. And you can see that they are somewhat distinct but overlapping. So it's not a huge separation. It's not a total change in, in, in these populations, but the relative abundances of these hemicellulose degraders were affected by harvesting very significantly. And in fact, the most se uh, severe treatment, OM3, uh, yielded the most distinct communities. So this, this was in line with what we might expect. So that's one approach. And then uh, one last one I want to mention. Uh, again, to get at functional groups of organisms, uh, or in this case, really, getting beyond the, the species and simply looking at the, the functions themselves involves analysis of shotgun metagenomes. So unlike the pyrotag analysis where we're looking at a single PCR epicon, in this case we sequence total DNA from the soil community. And then we probe it, we look for abundances of genes that encode uh, activities that we think are important to this system. And certainly the nitrogen cycle shown here is a very important aspect of uh, soil communities. And so here you can see highlighted a number of genes that encode key functions within this cycle. And models of these genes were used to search for the genes within the shotgun metagenomes from the soil samples. So we interrogated 105 um, metagenomes, which totaled a bit over a terabase of quality uh, DNA sequence. And what we can see here, um, quite surprising to me actually, is a fairly consistent effect. And so this is a heat map. You can see each of six genes across the bottom. And this, um, these cells represent the relative abundance of these genes compared to the corresponding control unharvested plot. So we're seeing uh, cells for all of the different harvesting treatments. They're uh, organized according to ecozones. And then you can see soil layers and then the individual harvesting treatments. And so what we see is that in every case where there's a significant effect, um, the uh, genes have increased in abundance relative to the control. So clearly we see differences between ecozones. So here's one with no significant effects detected here as well, although there are some uh, very significant increases that weren't statistically significant. We see others where you know, many or most of the genes are being affected. Um, but overall, we consistently see that the 
harvesting treatments uh, reduce the abundance of genes um, involved in the nitrogen cycle and so reduce the genetic potential for those activities. And um, I want to give you one last example, uh, in this case looking at a much broader group of, of genes. These encode uh, what are called carbohydrate active enzymes. These are um, the main group of enzymes involved in degrading uh, lignocellulose and other forms of biomass. And um, they're organized into many families, but here's an overall um, analysis of their abundance. Uh, so here we see data for a single uh, ecozone, the anterior Douglas fir ecozone, uh, where we had a very consistent effect of harvesting, reducing numbers of these KZ uh, genes. And so we have a reduction in the, the genetic potential for biomass degradation occurring within this ecozone. Now, I will note that it wasn't the same in all ecozones, but this was one of the clear examples. Um, however, uh, when we want to look at the individual gene families and get a better idea of specifically what activities are being um, uh, reduced or the genetic potential reduced by the harvesting, it became much more complex. And so um, it was actually, uh, the, the trends were not obvious, and it, it actually took machine learning uh, to find the genes that were consistently being affected by the harvesting. And so here you see uh, so-called predictive genes that were identified by a machine learning algorithm. And this is a, very complicated with a lot of data, but uh, there are just a couple of general trends I want to point out. So it, in each case, for both the forest floor data and the mineral layer, the top cells represent the uh, abundances of genes in the control, the unharvested treatment. And then below that you have the more intensively uh, harvested or the treatments of greater organic matter removal. And so you can see overall the vast majority of these, these <coughs> predictive genes were reduced by harvesting in their abundances with some very notable exceptions. And so many of these genes can be associated with specific uh, degradation of specific types of, uh, of uh, polymers, basically. Um, okay, so those are my examples. Um, so in this limited time, I, I guess what I'd like you to take away from this is you've seen several genomic-based approaches that have enabled investigation of forest soil uh, microbiomes. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've made some inroads towards understanding how these microbiomes respond to harvesting. And I think it's important to point out that for microbial communities, we, we were looking 10 to 15 years after harvesting and seeing these effects. So these would be very long-term effects uh, in, the, in the lifetime of a microbial community. And um, I think that the, the results suggest that, that the soil microbiome may in fact be predictive of the ability of forests to regenerate. But it's going to take uh, many more, it's going to take decades before we really know the answer to that. I also have to acknowledge a number of people, and especially the top three listed here who, who provided uh, the vast majority of the data in this talk. Uh, also the uh, funding for this work. And then uh, the last thing I want to do is uh, take an invitation to um, show you or make you aware of a company that I've been involved in founding um, that's focused on microbiome analysis. Um, I've, over my recent years, I've seen a, a huge demand for microbiome analysis and I think it's not unreasonable to think that this may be going the way of, of genomic testing and uh, I think there's a real uh, need to fill there. So thanks very much.